good morning, everyone uh, listening. Good morning to everyone overseas, and good afternoon to our, our more local attendees. My name is Dan Tyler, uh, and I'm a producer at Claring Gaming. Uh, very happy to be uh, moderating uh, and hosting this webinar with SG Digital uh, this afternoon. Uh, and the topic we're going to be looking at is legitimizing the US sports betting market uh, with insight into what the player wants. So we've got Scientific Games joining us along with H2 Gambling Capital. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Scientific Games offers dynamic games, systems and services for casino, lottery, social gaming, online gaming and sports betting. Uh, Open Sports, uh, which is Scientific Games redesigned sports betting portfolio. Uh, combines elements of the company's platform with streamlined services that stage operators for short and long-term success. Uh, with Open Sports, operators can pick the sportsbook technologies that make the most sense for their business. H2 Gambling Capital uh, is a supplier of data and intelligence regarding the global gambling industry. H2 collects and analyzes information from thousands of sources to attract both the online and land-based gambling markets and deliver accurate, detailed and independent intelligence to companies off the shelf subscription service uh, and on a bespoke basis for its consulting clients. So I'd note that we are, uh, there will be a Q&A section following the presentation, so please do submit any uh, questions as we go along and we'll try and try to address as many of them as possible uh, in the time we've got allocated today. Um, also, there are rather a lot of slides with quite a lot of detail, which I hope you'll all find interesting and useful. Um, don't worry about uh, digesting all the information at once because these will be available for download after today's session. So please take them at your own pace. So introducing our panelists um, today, we've got uh, Keith O'Loughlin, Senior Vice President of Sportsbook and Platforms at SG Digital, and David Henwood, Director at H2 Gambling Capital. So Keith, uh, could you kick us off and introduce yourself, please? Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, I, uh, Keith, obviously, and I run the sportsbook business within uh, SG Digital. So that includes all of our product development, our product innovation, the engineering of that, and also all of the implementation and delivery teams for our customers right across the world. So we've got customers from New Zealand, uh, Australia, Singapore, right across Europe. In the UK, we we power six of the seven largest brands being Ladbrokes, Coral, Betfair, Paddy Power, um, Skybet and William Hill. And in the US, uh, we have launched with Caesars uh, and we just announced recently that we are will launch shortly with Wynn. And also we've got uh, quite a lot of business with BCLC and a lot of Quebec in, uh, in Canada. So my, my job, my role is to understand the sports better what they want, what they need, and to work with our operators to deliver technology solutions to make them successful in delivering that to their customers. Great, thanks Keith. It certainly sounds like we've got the uh, the right person for today's webinar um, and some really interesting stuff. Uh, it sounds like it's happening in North America, so thanks very much for joining us. Um, and David, how about yourself? If you'd like to, to uh, say a few couple of words. Thanks Dan, and hello everyone. So I've been with H2 since the mid 2000s and I currently lead on H2 Premium. Uh, it's our bespoke uh, advisory service, which in simple terms, it unlocks the dedicated time of our core uh, analyst team and our network of associates all over the world that we have of H2. And we work to support operators, suppliers, regulators in the sector, but also increasingly we work outside the sector as well with banks, investors, uh, the sports themselves and the media, all of whom are sort of looking to gain market intelligence um, and data on over 150 jurisdictions that we now track all over the world from an independent perspective. Um, although headquartered in the UK, in the year leading up to the Supreme Court repeal of PASPA, we spent a dedicated six months in the US deep diving the size of the illegal sports betting market, which we're going to touch on today. And we've since produced two white papers post PASPA that set out our future state by state projections on the regulated market out to 2030. Great, thanks for that, David. Um, so yeah, with, with, with that, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll kick off um, and start with our first slide. But I, I think, David, you might um, be able to take us through a little bit. Of. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So if we're talking about legitimizing the US market, it's only right that we start with a quick overview um, of how state-by-state -state regulation looks currently. And I'm sure many of you would be familiar 
now with this detail, which we tried to summarise slightly differently uh, by yardage up the football up the football field. So we've got eight states in the end zone that have touched down and are currently offering uh, sports books under the regulated market. The anomaly in that list is number six, New Mexico, where the practice is still technically illegal um, statewide, but under the state tribal compact, which authorizes any and all forms of class three gaming on Indian lands within the state. One of the 18 tribes, the Santa Ana, has opened up its uh, opened up for business in October, its casino there. It's worth just flagging that as this move implies a degree of permissiveness that's not necessarily uh, going to be found in tribal compacts in other states, but it is one of our themes that comes out that this may well play out in uh, other states that, that follow as they progress up the, uh, up the pitch here. So uh, camped on the 10 yard line, you've got another eight states who've confirmed launch this year. And most of these are going to be likely in time for the new NFL season. So probably sometime in around um, August, July, August, if not September. Um, you got a further two, um, Colorado, and just this last week, Illinois, with its uh, 13 million population, one of the biggest states in the pipeline, um, whose bill is with the governor for signature um, literally right now. Um, in terms of the uh, huddled on the 50 yard line, um, you've got um, another 17 um, states who are probably a little bit after the gold rush now and uh, are probably you would consider in a state where legislation has slowed a little. Um, various discussions going on as to whether to offer bets um, on mobile, online, how high the tax rate should be, who can get a license to run the sports books um, and all sorts of issues around license fees for example. So those, those are probably explain why they're taking a little bit longer to come to um, fruition. And then in the in the group um, further down with, with, with the most yardage to go, probably just to flag uh, California there as, uh, as one of the biggest um, opportunities for the whole market. Um, we feel it will probably take some time because it, it um, is likely to um, uh, come into some discussion in terms of the, uh, the state tribal com compacts that are in place there, plus likely to need a referendum to um in terms of its uh in terms of the, ele the legislation that eventually goes through but uh, uh still on schedule to go through within the next uh, three to four years in our opinion great thanks thanks david really interesting and obviously so many moving parts and different stakeholders involved um and as you say all moving all the time with with illinois um changing place to, uh, just in the past couple of days with with the bill ready to go it seems um, so Keith, can, can you talk a little bit on, on which states SG offer sports betting across and, and perhaps comment on the expectations that you have for, for these regions? Yeah, it's funny, I was in Illinois last week and um, the, the sense of anticipation and excitement from people that I, that I just met there that, that weren't necessarily even connected with sports betting was palpable. And it was like um, they just won a semi-final and uh, had their eye on the final being uh, when it's going to be launched. Um, and I think that that uh, kind of excitement, you know, it, it is very akin with the excitement people feel with uh, different sports and their affinity with different sports. So, and we've seen that right across the board um, in the states that uh, that we work in, pre-regulation uh, and then post. Um, Scientific Games is licensed in pretty much every state across the US um, because it's got a long heritage of providing lotteries uh, and lottery systems and, and also gaming systems. Like we've been in business since 1974 um, in, in some shape or form. So uh, we, we've been regulated and so we operate in, in many states and in from a sports betting uh, perspective, we're live in New Jersey, we're live in Mississippi, we're live in Pennsylvania. Um, and we're working with customers on Nevada and a number of the uh, other states, both in the touchdown zone uh, and also in the 10 yard line. So um, we typically as a business work with the larger tier uh, brands who are looking at effectively every state that they can possibly be in and, uh, and where they want to be not only there but uh, they want to be first there and they want to lead. 
Sure, absolutely. Which is, I guess, why the the the, really, the states in the 50 yard line and beyond are, are still really important players. Um, so moving on to the uh, the next slide. Um, just on, there, on there, that there, point. So, sorry, when, when you say it's really important players, I, I actually think that uh, like Illinois, the, the move in Illinois last week caught a number of people by surprise, and I think that what we'll see is well, you know, the the, uh, the logical way of looking at the 50-yard line and and uh, the ones that's listed as on the sidelines, they will move at a pace. Um, like all sports, uh, I think there'll be many surprises and uh, many changes in um, uh, when legislation ends up getting brought forward, and people will object as well, and some which will delay it. So I think this is a space that's going to change and actually be very exciting uh, to watch how all this uh, plays out um, because the, 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 there's a huge passion for for sports betting and there's a natural inherent demand uh, that uh, customers have across the US for this. So I think the, uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Absolutely, yeah, I agree, and I think it's yeah a really interesting time. And you mentioned there just some of the um, some of the issues that might emerge, and, and perhaps that, that people haven't haven't thought of yet, and, and that are still to come. Um, so, with, with that in mind, and moving on to the the next slide and looking at the current state of play, um, David, can you, can you walk us through some of these uh, regulatory issues that we we've, we've got displayed in the slide, and, and just tell us about what some of the, the concerns are that you have with some of them. Muted. Hi, apologies all. We're just having some technical difficulties with the uh, the webinar platform, um, so we will revert back in just a couple of seconds once we've solved them. Thanks for your patience. Hi, David Keith. Can you hear me? That's my left hand. Hi, David. Dan. Hi, David. Thank you. Yeah, it, I'm back. Great. Okay, brilliant. Well, hopefully we're back on track and hopefully everyone else uh, can hear us too. Um, so thanks for all your patience. I can still see we've got uh, a good portion of the audience still listening, so um, we'll crack on as we were, I think. Um, so we were just coming up to uh, some of the key regulatory issues that are emerging. Um, so, David, I think if, if you could take us through uh, this slide and, and which ones you, you've identified with? Well, sure. I mean, I think what's clear, and most people see that no no two states are the same in terms of the regulation, and it is it is a bit of a patchwork out there um, in terms of uh, the different models that we're seeing. So it's not easy to draw some of the common issues, but we've we've listed here ten that we think 
um, we would pull out in terms of uh, commentary on the market so far, if you like. Uh, so our number one really is is all around, you know, the common thread probably being casino-led sports books, although there is a difference there in New Jersey in particular where um, you've obviously seen the big fantasy brands, FanDuel and DraftKings, um, having uh, securing quite a bit of market share um, and really exploiting what I would call first mover advantage through um, the pioneering nature of DFS being available for um, a good four or five years before regulated sports betting um, came to fruition. That really leads into the second um, area around the extent to which you you may see more open licensing going forward um, in some of the states. Uh, by that we mean uh, mobile sports betting, not having to partner, not having to physically partner um, with a bricks and mortar uh, property, be it a casino or or any other outlet, and whether that will increasingly be a model that we'll see in the future. Um, the third area we we talk about is while there is um, some uh, slow progress around discussions with mobile amongst legislators that potentially could lead the door to new retail emerging uh, as a default option. So, for example, sports betting being offer a, offer, offered via lottery uh, point of sale outlets uh, within sports bars and, and taverns or, of course, in stadia within arenas. And we've already seen that dialogue, for example, within uh, within New York quite recently. Our fourth area is around, as we, we said up front, around tribal compacts and state constitutional procedures, and they are still due process that um, are likely to slow down the ball game a little bit, um, simply because there is tribal uh, casino presence in some 29 states um, across America. So that will come into play. Um, fifthly, we talk about the leagues um, and they've got, and the position they've gone from, from actively opposing legislation to now talking, or they've been talking about integrity fees, um, to now monetizing via um, partnerships and data ownerships and sponsorship. Um, probably what is still needed there is a, is a true clarity of interrelationship with the industry um, before a proper win-win can, win can occur. Um, and, and we're confident that can happen further down the track, but that's still a dialogue uh, to happen in, in our opinion. And then moving into the last six, Obviously, the huge tax rate rate range won't, won't touch on in any great detail, but you've got 6.75% in Nevada going all the way up to 34% uh, in Pennsylvania been proposed and 51% currently in Rhode Island. Um, in terms of iGaming, um, we've got three states that currently do offer iGaming, Nevada, New Jersey and Delaware, but you've got two more already took it, looking at the opportunity of um, partnering up uh, sports betting with iGaming in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And that's an interesting um, debate that will now happen on the back of the DOJ uh, Wire Act opinion, um, which um, has been back and forth um, in terms of whether it will apply to iGaming or not, with latest, the latest rebuke by New Hampshire, um, saying that it, in their opinion, it's, it is just a, uh, applicable to sports betting um, is uh, is a workaround that's like we're likely to see more of in, in, in a number of the states. Um, and then just the last uh, two or three areas though, upfront licensing fees and technology restrictions will still uh, be potential barriers or limitations to the market. Um, and by state neighbors pushing activity to the borderlines, we, we talked there about some of the um, uh, states that are next door to each other, not always working um, in, in parallel, in fact, in, in working in, in polar opposites. So for example, um, New Jersey having a very uh, mobile driven offering and a, and a European style of offering, if you like, um, and, and New York being very much land based um, uh, as it is proposed, it will it is likely to open up in, in August. So you've got two very, uh, quite different offers uh, by states next to each other. And then lastly, the still simmering post-PASPA pushback is our, is, is our headline to, to reference federally um, within Congress from the anti-internet anti gaming lobby, from the DOG opinion on the Wire Act, you are still seeing um, a, 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 
uh, a, a rumour mongering within within federal circles that uh, a state by state rollout is is not the best model um, g going forward. Um, the headline there is probably that the horse has bolted to a certain extent, and that, and that you're seeing federal trying to play catch up with um, with something that is, with a ship that has already sailed. So um, these are all interesting issues uh, that we we just try to list there in summary. Thanks for that, David. One one point I was just going to pick up on, and I'll certainly um, hand over to Keith shortly. Just I was going to ask you about the uh, the New York um, uh, bill that's come out, and you mentioned the the possibilities of in stadium and things. Do you think that's a trend that's likely to continue? How, how do you see that that playing? Oh, almost certainly. I mean, I think it's the speed at which that that comes to market. Um, you saw DFS being offered in Stadia by a lot of the um, NFL and NBA teams, so. Why not the same with um, with sports betting? Um, it's just a it's just a legislative movement to uh, to play out, I think, as the as sports books gradually move away from traditional casino uh, properties. Absolutely. And, and Keith, um, how, how are you seeing some of these trends impact on, on you and your partners? I think just cover the last point in terms of Instadia. I think all you have to do is is go to a game. Uh, any game in the US and see the full entertainment experience that it is from the uh, the merchandise shop, the quality of food outlets, being able to get a beer brought to your seat, um, the, um, the entertainment beforehand at uh, all the timeouts at, at the break. Um, the It's a full-on uh, fantastic entertainment experience that is not just about the game. The game is 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 the core, but the the, the full experience um, I think resonates with a um, a sports fan, but also with sports better. And I think that that is you know the natural demand. Um, sports betting is a a complimentary product that's you know it started out uh at racetracks where you know people were you know many 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 years ago um and watching the races and having a flutter on and having a wager on the side um and that's where it started and that's what the 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 real essence and core of the product is is still about is about giving people a either a second screen experience or a complimentary experience to an event that they're either watching or uh watching remotely or watching where they are some of the other uh trends um that we see and, and they've mentioned in terms of the leagues um i i definitely think the leagues are trying to get to a position where it's win-win they they see there's a huge opportunity for revenue um and it's very you know leagues are, are very commercial um uh, but the challenge in that balance is is to make sure that they they're giving as much value in product um as they are in terms of receiving in terms of funds um i think some of the other things that we're seeing is that uh there's a lot of uh, upside that um, the casinos are seeing about having retail sports books um, in their properties. They're getting a huge amount of football, footfall, and and so while they're getting you know natural uh, um, gross win from the sports betting, the there's a far higher effect in terms of all the ancillary products the you know the uh, casino um handle and hold the uh, uh, accommodation the food all of the other um aspects of the casinos are getting a, a significant lift uh, for this i think the uh, a couple of other pieces just to, to touch on i think the um the wire act as they've mentioned is is having a is, is a huge impact because it, it means that the way the technology it it, it picks into uh, number eight as well listed on the slide which talks about licensing fees and technology because um for the smallest states and for the biggest states you need to have effectively exactly the same technology footprint um in state for for each and and that's a uh, that's a huge cost it's it's a it's effectively it's like running a completely separate uh platform in in every state so there's there's costs there's logistics there's operational challenges some of those um make a lot of sense like you know for for uh, anybody who looked at the election coverage um when uh donald trump got elected you look at the the 
the blue and the red, you know, the, the Hillary Clinton got all of the votes on the West Coast and the East Coast. Donald Trump got effectively nearly every state uh, that was across the center of the US. And, you know, and, and, this, and, and my point is that <clears throat> there are very different uh, trends, very different nuances, very different demands, very different uh, people and culture uh, across each state and so having individual sports betting uh, platforms that are delivering tailor-made product and tailor-made pricing um, focusing on the individual teams and individual sports that are popular in each state um, is something that ultimately is going to give the customer the best experience in the medium and in the long term. Absolutely, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. You know, David mentioned that uh, the regulation is very much a state by state case, but I think also from from a product side, it also needs to be taken uh, on a state by state level as well. I think that one other point just to, to make is that that the uh, the level of regulation is far higher than you typically see in in any other part of the world. You know, the, the biggest operators in, in the most mature markets, let's say the UK and Australia, uh, being probably the two most mature regulated markets in the world. Um, any operator, you can you can make updates 400 times a day if you wish, if your technology allows. You can make small updates, big updates. You can um, do whatever you want um, from a system perspective. Now, obviously, there's there's regulation making sure that player protection is at the f at the forefront, etc. But the onus is on the operator uh, to be able to make sure the technology is correct and and fit for purpose. Whereas when in the US, the level of regulation and, and level of testing that's required to get a software release out means that it's it's a far less agile process. Where you know, for example, in New Jersey, everything needs to get tested by the DGE and, and a typical release can take anything from two to four weeks to be able to do. So it's a different mindset, it's a different way of managing software and technology stacks. Shouldn't impact necessarily the customer, but it certainly takes it takes a lot longer and is much more controlled in getting product to market. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think, we, you know, with, the, with that point in mind, um, if, we, if we look at the next side, looking at the, the conversion of a, a legal to legal, um, and I know H2 Gambling uh, Capital's recent, recent research uh, shows that the legal market will take up to a decade to catch up with the illegal market, um, which demonstrates absolutely the need for a strong offering that can't be paralleled uh, through legal channels. Um, so, David, if you just want to first walk us through what we're seeing on the slide here um, in terms of the data and, and what the key findings were um, before we look again, uh, key from the opposite perspective, uh, perspective. Um, on how we can drive conversion to legal sites through these product offerings. Yeah, and I want to qualify this up front by saying that because we're British rooted, we, we are naturally um, conservative and that, that's with a small C um, on our numbers. So we do we do tend to underestimate the market. And one of the numbers over the last 15 years or so that we've been tracking the sector that really raised our eyebrows was when the AGA was suggesting that a 150 billion um, uh, pounds, well, sorry, dollars worth of uh, bets had, was leaving the US um, just just uh, in 2016, um, and, and we thought this this seemed like a um, a hell of a lot. So in the year pre to uh, to the PASPA repeal, um, we put the, the H2 team on it and, and did our own deep dive of that figure, our own analysis for, for some six months um, across the US and, and we actually found it higher. So that's that 196 uh, billion handle or, or 10.4 billion uh, gross win or GGR um, was the size of the illegal market that we, that we found in the year immediately pre preceding the uh, Supreme Court decision. Um, comparable almost to Apple's global uh, global annual revenue in the same year, or almost one and a half times the amount wagered on the whole Las Vegas Strip, and that's all gambling. Uh, so quite simply, no other market has started with such a, a huge or entrenched illegal market offshore. Now, whether a lot of that is linked to um, organized crime, whether it's professional bettors, or whether it is just uh, regular punters, um, it is it is a sizable um, figure that, uh, that that needs to be considered here if we are talking about legitimizing um, a US market going forward, which is why we say uh, we think it'll take 
a, a decade for it to catch up. And initially what's happened as, uh, as there's been a lot of increased exposure around sports betting in the US is that a legal market has actually bumped up um, a little bit in 2018. So it's gone from 10.4 uh, billion GGR up to 11.2, um, which means that if you look at the regulated uh, market in its value, which is 0.4 uh, billion in 2018, that is actually only 4% of the uh, uh, of its illegal counterpart offshore. So there's there's quite a way to go before um uh, you know before the whole um, market is legitimised. And uh, you've got a, a lot of black and grey market act activity offshore that won't go away quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and keep with that, with that in mind, how how can operators drive uh, conversions to the legal sites? Um, I, I think that uh, human nature uh, is that people want to do things easily and I think the, um, the way that operators can, can really do it is to provide a few things, so frictionless experience that just make it so easy and build an experience around the customer from a way to deposit to be able to place your wagers and just give them an experience that really truly delights the customer. I think omnichannel is a uh, plays a huge part in that uh, it's definitely not something that uh, the legal market uh, can do and and you know the, the whole aspect of bonusing around that is um, it's hugely important. Uh, I recently saw a video of Jeff Bezos in uh, in 1999, and he was sitting in uh, in his office, and he just started this business called Amazon. I think even that the name was written in black marker on a whiteboard behind him, um, and uh, his but his his core point was that it wasn't about building a book business. Um, uh, it was about building a business that books were effectively his trial run. He just wanted a business that gave customers an exceptional. Uh, level of service and a really frictionless way to be able to, to access the products and access the long tail. There are a lot of parallels with the world of sports betting. Like a, if you take a, you know, the uh, US focused sports and then you supplement it with all of the soccer, tennis and, and all the other sports, there's probably 300,000 uh, games being traded in play uh, in 2018, and you know, for each of those, there might be 30 to 50 markets. That is, you know, that is a long tail business, if uh, if ever you could define one. And what we've seen is that the by offering that that full suite of products and offering customers a an exceptionally easy interface and a an experience that just is. Uh, is intuitive. We've we've got a, a principle that we talk about fire, which is fast, uh, intuitive, robust. In that it's there um, at peak times, there when customers want it, uh, and uh, extensive. So you've got that full range of product. And um, when when operators do that and give that to customers every time, then I think that they have they are well on the way to being able to to convert a lot of the that illegal business. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Keith. Um, and then I guess to so take another bit of a deep dive into the numbers uh, more specifically, uh, if you again, David, wouldn't mind walking us through the figures uh, on the screen and demonstrating what this means for the, the growth of the US market. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is how it is going to change and how, how the regulated market will, uh, will gradually grow over the course of um, the next decade up to 2030. Um, on the graphic on the left hand side, we've looked at what's happening in the full year since uh, uh, since the PASPA repeal. And quite simply, the market has doubled um, from what it was just uh, just pre the Supreme Court decision. That's the gross win market doubling there from 0 0.29 uh, billion to 0, to 0 0.6. Um, if you look at where that uh, main activity has, has been, um, it's really been around two sports in in, in particular the the NFL season and a lot of uh, a lot of activity activity in and around the the playoffs and the and the Super Bowl um, and then March Madness the co the college basketball tournament uh, um, where uh, we were seeing betting peaking at thirty four point five million pounds uh, dollars sorry a day. Um, 
across all the sports, the average hold margin is still quite low um, in, in comparison to um, a lot of the other markets around the world at 6.7%. Um, but I will qualify that uh, you are seeing um, some parlay um, betting increasing over the year, which uh, is offering double digit uh, returns to, to the operators, up, upwards of 17, 18%. Um, going forward, the, the graphic on the right-hand side, uh, well, quite simply, the market's going to travel in the next 18 months. Uh, you'll see all that all that regulatory activity that we had up front in the in the deck, and then it's going to grow tenfold in the next five years. So, so quite a steep, um, rapid um, curve going upwards, um, all the way up to we have it at 8.4 two billion uh, gross win across 32 states by 2030. Um, and for those of you that are, uh, are, are interested in the handle numbers, that's just that's just under $80 billion. Um, that will generate something in the region of a billion in, in tax revenues. Um, and that's a growth change rate from uh, a CAGA of 1% just prior to the regulated market to a 25% CAGA growth from 2018 to 2030. So that's a significant um, market emerging. Yeah, absolutely, some, some staggering numbers and some rapid growth, um, which I guess, Keith, provides a, a lot of challenges for, for the operators. Um, what, what, what are they and how can you handle this from an operator's perspective? Um, I, I think one of the challenges for Robert is what, what, what numbers like this uh, hide is the, and even if you were to look at this number on a daily basis, um, it would still hide the real challenges it is to run the back office and, and technology aspects of sports betting because it's in the 10 to 15 minutes before big events is when uh, you get hordes of customers coming through, both from a retail perspective, but also from a digital perspective. And a digital perspective, it, it can be like a, a DDoS attack, but with with wallets, with customers, with money trying to pay and trying to get their wagers on. And and you know, I see that uh, like our customers uh, across the board, for example, um, have more wagers on say the Grand National in, in the UK, they have more wagers on that day than Amazon does on Black Friday. Um, and and But it's concentrated in really short periods of time. So the, the pressure that it puts on technology is like no other industry. And that's because every event has a time, the prices are changing right coming up to an event. For example, you know, on a, on a busy Saturday or a busy Sunday, we're seeing 130,000 price changes every minute. So when you look at the, you know, laying wagers and with with such a fluid backdrop to be able to do that, getting your technology right and making sure that your customers, you know, the end the end punter is able to get their their wager on when they want it, is a real challenge for for operators. I think the the other aspect of driving that is giving customers great product scoreboards for example with real depth of information particularly around u.s sports that are so uh, statistical and and the you know the dfs has has hasn't driven but it certainly enhanced the uh, the market's view of using statistics and uh, to be able to select the the wagers that the customers want to have so i think you know, taking all of those um, aspects in place of it, having robust technology, making sure you're giving great product, and those are things that are going to be able to keep your customers coming back time and time and time again. Because I think that the bar and expectation is high. So while the industry is is new in the US, um, customers, you know, are are used to using. Amazon and Facebook and Instagram and used to a very high level of service and their expectation is high. So I think that operators need to make sure that they, they get it right and they get it right first time. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, reliability is so, so important for, for customer attention moving forward. Um, so looking at the, the next slide, I know David, you mentioned a little bit about iGaming earlier. Um, just a snapshot here of the, the iGaming growth in, in New Jersey since uh, August 2018. Um, what did your what did your findings from from your research say uh, about this? Now we just wanted to flag this because this is a finding I think is really important. Um, people talk about cannibalization, uh, sports betting, and eye gaming, and what you've got here is actually proof that um, they can actually be complementary. 
uh, rather than substitutes. So when New Jersey launched its sports betting in, uh, in August last year, um, and in the period uh, up to March um, 2019, during that time, iGaming has actually grown uh, 38% in, in parallel. So it's gone up from $24.8 million in, uh, in August up to just under 40, 40 million, 39.2 in March. So it's just evidence really, um, we wanted to pull it out that um, there's no cannibalization evidence uh, so far. David. Um, and then moving on, uh, Keith, looking at the, the wider sports betting landscape, um, can you comment on some of the, the data we've got there in this slide? Yeah, so look, at, at Scientific Games, we have a well-established insight and research team working closely with key partners such as H2GC uh, to consistently evaluate the sector and player habits. Since the Supreme Court overturn of the of the law last year, US casino operators have had real opportunity to capitalize on one of the fastest growing gaming sectors in the world. It's a once in a generation, once in a lifetime uh, change and an opportunity. Uh, looking at this data, data for the first nine months is showing that in more states legalize sports betting, we see incremental sports betting handle growing the overall market volume without any cannibalization. We're not seeing cannibalization in, uh, in Nevada, which was a concern. We don't see cannibalization of gaming. We don't see cannibalization as customers bring uh, launch new sports. We don't see cannibalization as customers launch new markets. It's all additive. And the, you know, certainly from our view, New Jersey case study shows that the, um, the gaming uh, revenue growth pace significantly outpaces inflation and just shows that the better and the broader the experience that you give uh, punters, the the more um, that you engage with them, the more loyalty that you get and the more repeat business that you get. And overall, it's, it's the most positive um, outcome. So just uh, for me, no cannibalization on sports to gaming, no cannibalization as you add more sports, and no cannibalization as you add more markets. It's all just additive. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, thanks, Keith. And, and David, can you show us through, through the next slide? Again, looking at the sports betting landscape. Yeah, these are our final couple uh, from the white paper uh, that we published. So the, the, the one on the left on, on mobile, um, now, mobile initially has been limited to so only, only 21.6% of the market in 2018 at the end of the year, um, but we forecast that growing up to 55% uh, of all bets will be on mobile by 2030 uh, across those 32 states. But in New Jersey, it's been, uh, it's been a story that's been straight to mobile. So 57% uh, of bets were on the channel at the start of the football season and that topped out at 80% by um, the turn of the year and it stayed at that level uh, pretty much since right through to, uh, to now. Um, if you look at it globally, um, uh, online sports betting is growing at 10 times the rate of retail um, and mobile is, uh, is over, two, uh, over two thirds of all gambling um, on mobile is now sports betting. Um, so quite simply, mobile really lends itself to the sports betting offer um, in terms of its sophistication. And then just on the right hand side paints a picture really of what um, what the market may uh, or we, we are forecasting will look like um, in terms of the state by state split. So you currently got Nevada and New Jersey have 60 percent of the market um, amongst the uh, amongst the eight states that are, uh, have opened out. But that uh, their share is going to drop to 13% when the bigger states like California, New York, uh, and Massachusetts to um, open up. So you'll you'll eventually get a big five: Nevada, New Jersey, California, New York, and Massachusetts will make up uh, over half of the total U.S. market in five years' time. Well, again, again, really interesting uh, numbers and figures. Uh, Keith, any comments on this? I think it's going to give operators fantastic opportunities to be able to test products and to see what resonates in in various states. So, you know, for example, we've got a bet builder product uh, that we see, you know, in in some 
uh, in some countries um, that it's doing 20% of soccer bets and in other areas it's doing 2% and I think that it's there, it's those kind of nuances about what products really resonate and learning from one state to the other, seeing what works and, and being able to bring that across the market gives operators an unprecedented opportunity to to maximize their uh, the resonance uh, with customers. And, and I think that uh, there will be big five, but in in all of the, uh, if you take all the other states, there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunity and money to be made across the uh, smaller states as well. Absolutely, thank you. And and with a with an eye, I guess, on the on the customer and the player that you mentioned there, um, I, I know the scientific games research and materials uh, from the course of the last year uh, has included some findings on player preferences uh, and incremental spending for sports betting. Um, and just want to again, yeah, if you could just run us through some of these slides, uh, looking at the sports better and and the demographics. Yeah. So. Um, it's a the, the uh, youth in the market is respondents under 40 um, or 45 is unlikely to have placed sports bet in the last 12 months compared to those uh, 40 and over, um, and I think that you know that's playing into the the part in the previous slide which is talking about the um, the mobile being the key device, um, and and I think that. You know, from a gender perspective, um, it's male respondents twice as likely as female. I, I think that uh, the that in some respects breaks a breaks a stereotype because in in other markets it's there's a far higher representation of of male um, wagering uh, than there is female. So I think that's a that's a uh, key piece. You know, um, the, uh, you know I, I think that um, the you know, seventy percent have have played um, uh, casino games in in the last year. Seventy percent have also played a lottery game, and and this goes back to the point that I made a couple of months ago: is that th this is about people being able to have a gaming and and betting experience, and there are many different avenues, channels, and and ways to be able to do it, and and so you know, hence the point about it not just not about being cannibalization and that you know, there's an there's a inherent latent demand um, for this product because it's such a complementary product to sports in the US and you know for for those of us who've been lucky enough to be at uh, games in the US you can see the, the not just at games but all you got to do is walk into any sports book on game day um, and and you see the the huge passion um, that people have for sports and uh, the the competitive element that that brings to it um, which will bring out uh, the demand for for sports betting products I think just a, a couple of points that I just want to make on this slide is so you know where where do sports betters uh, prefer to place bets? Thirty percent prefer to place a casino, forty percent prefer to place online, um, and twenty percent uh, on terminals. A couple of key points here. So what what we've seen is that um, certainly in in casinos and retail, uh, people are using the kiosks over and above. Um, going up to the counter. People want self-service, they want frictionless, they want easy, they want fast, um, and uh, that's, a, that's a key learning from the market. Um, I, I also think and there's, there's something that kind of, uh, it's overarching on this, is that um, it, somebody isn't necessarily, uh, you can't say somebody is a mobile sports better, somebody is a casino better. In the same way that, you know, anybody, um, some of us, you know, some days you're going to have fast food. Some days you're going to want to go to a, a fine dining restaurant. Some days you're going to cook at home. And some days you mightn't have time to do any of those. Um, it's depending on the uh, your time available, what experience that you want, um, and how you want to consume the product. I think people will use um, will use various ways. So somebody might say, "Look, I always like to go to the casino, um, but you know, you can only spend a certain amount of time physically there." Whereas, you know. 90% of the time people have got the mobile phone in their pocket and are checking it up to 100 times in any one day. And so, you know, I think that the it's the blend of being able to give customers the way to interact um, 
whenever they want and however they want um, in a in a seamless way is the is the ultimate way to try and deal with this but but it, it does show that you know just focusing on mobile is not going to cut it and it comes back to again how to try and counteract the illegal market is by giving customers that rounded seamless frictionless stable scalable robust experience um and uh final slide just you know the, the um our our statistics are showing 65 percent of uh, wagering is on football followed closely by basketball basketball is definitely is growing um 30 percent uh, of people have had a bet on on baseball 25 percent of people have had a bet on uh, racing and 20 percent of people have had a bet on soccer so um the uh, th there's a broad range of sports, but you know I, I've mentioned earlier that uh, with a number of sports, a number of markets and events, I think the long tail uh, spreads very long uh, on this one. Absolutely, thanks, thanks for that, Keith. And really, really interesting to see you know the different demographics what they're betting on. Uh, but I guess as, as as you say, it comes back to the product, making sure it's easy, fast, uh, and reliable for, for customers and, and players to to bet. Um, so moving on to the next slide, if we look at uh, sports betting funding, um, Keith, we can see here some some insights into how players think uh, about funding their sports betting activity. Um, can you talk us through again your your findings here? Yeah, I think um, the you know from a um, um, sports betting perspective, you know that, that there um, forty three percent of people are uh, using you know their their additional money. So if they've got They've got a wallet. They're using it across gaming, using it across um, uh, sports. Um, uh, the you know, there's a small number of people saying they're spending less on on shopping. Small number of people saying spend less on on leisure activities. Um, and again, smaller number of people, 16%, saying less on lottery games and and on uh, casino gambling. So, um, I, I I think that um, you know that. People are looking at this. This is an entertainment play um, for people. You know, it, it's not an investment. If it was an investment, we'd all just put our salaries at the end of every month uh, into our sports betting operator and be expecting a return at the end of the month. That's not what, what people do. This is about people being able to have a, uh, a a wager and have a bit of fun and and take it that they they get some value and fun from the experience. And you know, with a 95% uh, payback if you look at you know the effectively a 5% hold in New Jersey or in Nevada 95% of, of money that's wagered is getting paid back to the customer so you know they, they're they're getting a good run for the money and getting high quality products and and I think that uh, that it, it bodes well for strong player protection and then having a long-term relationships with customers Absolutely. Um, and then so looking looking ahead at the uh, some of the opportunities, um, Keith, you again supplied a series of slides here discussing the the opportunities for sports betting. Um, how do you? I know we touched on it a couple before, but how, how do you envision operators operators approaching these? Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, you know this is the you know continuing on the point that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's when you say it's good entertainment. That's what customers want. They want to be entertained. You know, they they know that they're paying their twenty, forty, fifty, a hundred bucks uh, for a wager, and and they want to have fun. You know, and the the key thing that uh, they're looking here is that customers want to be able to to looking at the right. They want to know how much they're willing uh, to lose before placing uh, before placing bet. They want to be in control. Um, they they want to have uh, as much statistics and data in terms of being able to um, inform their their betting, right? And you know this is the the piece where we say operators have an opportunity to introduce sports betters to try other casino games like tables, um, skill based based games. I think that uh, you know the, the the data is resounding in terms of showing that. The, the cross sell opportunities across the full facet of, of gaming um, is hugely important. Marketing education is, I think, fundamental to this because you know you, you all you got to do is walk into a um, into a sports book 
um, and if you've never had a wager before, it's very intimidating. And um, particularly, if people don't like to be intimidated. It, it goes against their nature if they feel embarrassed. So giving people that support, making it easy for them, making it intuitive, and then um, helping them just get over the the that initial pain point of understanding how all this works uh, in a very supportive way is hugely important. And multilingual, you know, the, the is with the population across the US um, is fundamental to be able to serve um, everybody. Um, and just to just to cover because I'm I'm very cognizant of time. So just to cover you know this slide and overall is that the um, uh, people want entertainment, they want excitement. Um, uh, some people, you know, 34% of people are doing it to make money. I think everybody in in their heart is is doing this with the hope of making money. Um, but a it's more of a a hope. There are always going to be sharp customers. Um, and and uh, you know, in in a, an industry as as big as this, you know, the sharp customers, you know, and and ultimately will help to lead and get better prices and get. Uh, a more representative market so that everybody can have fair fair wages over a period of time because they make operators uh, invest in having better algorithms better automation um, and that ultimately ends up with with uh, better products but I think you know overall the the uh, answer to the questions here show that uh, people want to have fun you know and and it's uh, it's as fundamental and as simple as that yeah, thank you. And and I guess coming into that, as you say, so so aware of time, but um, we've got a lot of really good questions coming through. So thank you all of those uh, to all those who've submitted questions so far. Um, but just coming on to our, our last slide then, um, and you know, in the in the nature of people just having, wanting to use it as a a product and for some entertainment value. Um, in terms of mobile uses, we've talked about it a lot. Obviously. Um, uh, shows some really big promise for the market. But David, what, what are you seeing as some of the trends as far as general mobile usage um, seen across customers? No, I mean, I think just to conclude, yeah, I mean, if, from what Keith was saying there, I, w I wonder if the differentiators are going to be are going to be geography and, and generations to to kind of phrase, if you like, geography in terms of the regulators um, and how those uh, who may be a bit more um, on the coast, shall we say, using the the political analogy earlier, earlier with Donald Trump, are a bit more open to to offering mobile um, within the um, uh, within the overall legislation, um, and and generations in terms of um, you know operators being able to embrace uh, obviously the increasing millennial market coming through. They're going to want to uh, place better. You know, they've grown up. They've grown up with the mo with the mobile. They've grown up online. It's where they. Um, it's where a lot of their leisure takes place rather than necessar necessarily visiting a casino property. Um, and the extent to which that could be the difference um, in, in the States as it rolls out, there's certainly the opportunity there. And we've picked out three ways that, that might explain that. And that's the, um, the, the, uh, the introduction of the, of the media organizations in the States. So uh, obviously you've seen Fox already partnering with the Stars Group um, in terms of its introduction into uh, in, into the dialogue and uh, ESPN as well, um, talking to Caesars about producing more content, a lot of which um, should, na should naturally find its way onto, uh, onto mobile. The Silicon Valley influence in terms of things like digital payments, um, the, the, um, where, where a lot of the data companies get their, um, get their uh, intelligence from going forward, a lot of that is going to be through mobile technology. Um, Esports, we just wanted to flag simply because it is um, it's quite a big market in um, in America, although it is predominantly dominated by Asia. Certainly compared to UK, Europe, um, we know that the esports viewership is uh, is upwards of 50 million, 54 million, I think was the figures we saw, uh, which already puts it bigger than the NHL. So it's up there with the big four, uh, the big four sports leagues in terms of a, a, um, a, an activity in its own right. And the extent to which uh, millennials growing up uh, with esports um, will drive a betting market that is a crossover into iGaming as well, obviously all potentially taking place on mobile. Um, and the third area where we think the US could be different is in and around the leagues. 
and the sports and the, and the win-win that there genuinely could be between the relationship between sport and and the, and the betting sector. Um, the leagues are a lot more powerful than the um, uh, than the, uh, the, the some of the federations and, and leagues in uh, in UK and Europe. Um, and uh, there's certainly the you know if they if they do get behind the, the betting offer and they're comfy with the um, with the relationship. It will certainly drive new sources of revenue. It will drive different demographics um, to uh, to the sports. Um, and if the leagues get behind it and the media get behind it, then the lawmakers should get behind it. So we think that is a potential 360 that could uh, that we could see in America going forward. Great, thanks, David and Keith. Any any concluding thoughts along those lines? And uh, before I open us up to the Q and A. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think the the sports betting experience that uh, grows in the US will be quite different than it is uh, anywhere else in the world. I think it uh, it will be less transactional and and more entertaining. Um, I think it will be as they mentioned. You know, we've seen the deals that uh, Caesars have done with ESPN and the Fox deal with Stars. I think the media companies will put this at their core. We've seen from the UK market when uh, Skybet um, twinned with Sky Sports, the the success of having a media brand and uh, to be able to drive um, product and, and make sure that you really resonate with your consumer. So we've seen how, how positive um, that has been. Um, and and I think that uh, you know the, the learnings and the the way the um, the market will grow and and innovate in the US will actually um, see the best of that adopted uh, right across the world and and I think it will lead to a fresh wave of innovation that uh, will um, shine a light and uh, and influence very positively on, on other markets. So uh, I, I think that um, all bets are off in some respects about how uh, uh, how exciting it's going to be and how much change it's going to be because the uh, you know, we collectively haven't even scratched the surface of what it's going to be. There's a huge latent demand that uh, customers have because it fits. It's such a great product uh, in terms of sports betting that's complementary with the fan base uh, that is across the US for, for their sports and their love then of, of other sports too. Great, thanks Keith. And, and yeah, absolutely really exciting times ahead. And um, with that in mind, I'd, I'd like to just move on quickly to the, uh, the Q&A segment of our webinar session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for sending them through. Um, I just want to add that joining us for the Q&A today is Stephanie Bonner, uh, who's Senior Director of Market Research and Insight Strategy um, with SG Digital. Stephanie and her team are, are instrumental in driving insight across insightful cross-product research uh, to benefit their customers in the gaming space. Um, so any questions you, that you have in relation to SG player studies and uh, associated me methodology, um, Stephanie will be on hand to answer. Um, so, with that in mind, welcome, Stephanie. Are you, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Great. So, uh, to welcome you, the, the first question goes to you. Um, does uh, we've, we've got one that coming in saying, does SG uh, conduct its player research studies on a regular basis, uh, and is there any way of audience, any way audiences can get access to these studies? Yes, thank you. Um, we actually, you know, I want to say SG is heavily invested um, in in all player research activity across all product lines. We believe that the player is at the heart of everything we create uh, from an entertainment experience here at SG. And we do, we have, we have many different faucets of research from panels, focus groups, ethnog ethnographic studies, player journey mapping. And you know, all of our products are created with the, with the player at the heart of everything. Yes, so the answer is we, we can share some of those insights, but they are on a case by case basis. Um, they are proprietary, but if you're absolutely interested in any of the research, you can reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to, to share some of those snippets. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, and, and for Keith, then, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion around the opportunity with mobile, which we obviously just touched upon. Um, what, what do you see as the role of land-based properties in the sports betting space? Uh, I, I think that... Um... Uh, land-based properties, but from a regulation point of view, you know, in, in most states, it's going to be land-based properties first and second. Uh, I think the land-based properties are the place to give uh, those mobile 
mobile customers because they're actually they're just consumers and customers they're not mobile or land based and you know i think people when they can get to a land based property will get in and they'll get that uh, full sports book experience of you know watching a product uh, being being able to sit in you know seeing it on uh, 40 foot screens and being able to get a beer behind and um the you know literally have everything at their fingertips um and that's going to as of, as of uh, mentioned earlier that's going to spill over and allow uh all of the other aspects the you know the accommodation the food the shows and also the the full gaming experience so i think the there's a huge investment that we're seeing uh across uh across our partners um in the land based um side of things and they're looking at it much more than just seeing getting a straight return on sports betting even though they will get a straight straight return and and i think both having that a an exceptional omni-channel proposition tied into rewards programs and tied into mobile is what's going to bring people back from being on a an illegal bookmaker offshore and um, to back to to a us based fully legit fully regulated business Thank you. Then, uh, and just uh, a similar question, I guess um, we talked a lot about player habits and things throughout this, this seminar today. Um, and we've had one question come in saying, uh, "How do you see margins evolving for sports betting operations? Oh, sorry, sports betting operators. Uh, how much do you see players in the US betting on accumulator bets?" Um, so we've actually seen um, players. There's more demand in the US for accumulator bets than uh, than we've seen in other parts of the world so i think the demand is definitely there um and i think from a margin perspective uh i think the the margin will actually improve from uh, in in the us typically the, the margin has been at the lower end of what uh, of what you see in in various markets around the world um and i think that as more product comes into market more automation, better tools, because the you know the market is going to grow, and, and operators and firms such as ourselves uh, can invest in those. That they uh, because of that investment, the the it was better quality product, which ultimately lead to a better return for customers. Great, thanks, Keith. Um, and if we've got another for for you, for you Stephanie, um, what what other customer preferences did the SG research throw out in relation to betting opportunities? You know, further to what Keith was talking about, you know, and having different types of betting that will help with some of that house advantage and, and the overall hold in GGR, we do see different demographics and age groups preferring different product types and bet types. I mean, we know that soccer, for instance, actually appeals to a slightly younger audience. We know that uh, parlays and um, in-prop betting and, and things like that definitely appeal to different demographics, and that will only help some of the edges and bets that are received. In terms of some of the demographics that appealed to mobile, like Keith mentioned earlier, you know, by engaging the consumer who is the younger demographic that is more apt to bet on the mobile device, will only drive some of that cross betting and, and drive them to try table games and skill based. And, and we have that research to support that. Uh, we, we definitely have done a ton of demographic research, understanding what their preferences are in terms of what they'd be most likely to play. And there are nuances. So developing a, an app that really applies and, and appeals to certain segments will only drive and convert the legal betting uh, to a legalized environment via the mobile play. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, I'm, I'm slightly aware of time because I know we've run over, um, but just one, one more question that's come through that I'd like to uh, first invite David to um, to answer and then uh, Keith or Stephanie, feel free to, to give the thoughts as well. Um, lots of lots of stakeholders at play here and, and possibly some new um, kind of parties coming in that, that we haven't seen yet. Uh, who do you think will be the likely winners and losers uh, going forward in, in this space in the US? Nice broad one to finish off with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, from my perspective, I think um, you know, in any, any other sports betting market that that's started up, those who've those who've entered the market at an early stage with sort of first mover advantage have have tended to do well. So, um, for those of you looking to still enter, I would um, I wouldn't hold back too much too much uh, longer if you can. But uh, in general terms, I think the winners will you know definitely have a strong U.S. facing uh, brand. Um, obviously, access to licenses. 
as we talked about mobile, the technological operating excellence, especially digital marketing, um, potentially strong balance sheet investment potential, multi-state exposure, access to a database of sports betting customers. All of these things are important prerequisites to, um, you know, to access quite a sizable slice of the pie. But we would we would stress there that it is it is a big cake um, that there's going to be available going forward. And just a, a final figure from us, although we said 8.4 billion by 2030, that's actually only a third of what the total attainable market could be if all the tax rates um, came down at the right market equilibrium and a lot more states regulated. And, and just to add on, you know, that I, I kind of take a different approach. I look at the real winner in all of this is the player. I think they're going to have a much more unique experience that's customized for their preferences. It's going to keep them fully engaged and provide the entertainment value proposition that they can't currently get from an illegal sports betting market. Think about their seamless experience they're going to have. They're going to go to a casino. They're going to want to wager on sports. They're going to easily be able to play tables. We are actually going to be able to fully keep them more engaged than we have ever before and provide a better experience to them. So, I mean, I definitely think that will also benefit the operator and SG and everyone else. But by providing, you know, that superior product and experience, we'll grow this industry together. There's no doubt. Great. Well, thank you both. And, and some, some real good thoughts to leave us on um, as, as we watch this space develop ahead of us. Um, and that's all we have time for today, sadly. Uh, thank you very much again to David, Keith, and Stephanie for joining us and, and sharing your insight. Uh, really greatly appreciate it. Um, today's webinar has been recorded and it, and it will be available to listen to on demand shortly for you to rewatch and share with your colleagues. Um, for, before we close out the day, uh, I of course want to invite you to download your free copy of the second H2 white paper uh, on the US sports betting market from the new igbnorthamerica.com website. Um, and additionally, I'd like to thank our sponsors for today at SG Digital. Um, for more information regarding their open sports services, please contact the sales uh, at SG Digital email address seen on screen. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. This webinar has been produced in association with ICE North America, which saw huge successes last month in Boston. Um, please keep an eye on uh, both icenorthamerica.com and igpnorthamerica.com for the latest updates, because um, there, there may be some new events coming soon. Uh, otherwise, thanks very much for joining us, and I um, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, consider a motion to.